Well, this is week three in our series on the book of Job. And if you weren't here for the first two sermons, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to them because I covered a lot of material and it's information that's crucial to understanding the book of Job. So make sure you go back and watch those two sermons. Now, let me give you a basic outline of the book so I can show you what we've covered and what we're going to cover this morning. So here's a basic outline of the book of Job. It should be coming up on the back wall. You'll notice so far that we've covered the prologue. A prologue is more than just an introduction. It's an introductory section that gives you the events or, or the activities that took place that's leading up to the main part of the story. And so what we find in the first five verses is a little bit about Job's character and who he is and who he was and what he owned and how many children he had. And then in verses 6 through 22, this is the first accusation and attack against Job. All of the sons of God, in other words, all of the angels came before the Lord and Satan comes with them. And God calls him out on something. He notices that Satan has been fixated on Job. So he says, have you noticed my servant Job? And of course he had. And he talks about how good of a man that Job is according to man's standards. And Satan makes his accusation. He says, if you'll take away everything that he has, I guarantee you he will curse you to your face. And he'll stop serving you. And so the Lord allows him to go and to attack Job. And he does. He loses everything that he owns. And the worst thing is, all of his children die in a tornado. And yet, Job does not curse God. In fact, Job says this, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, his theology was wrong, but he still blessed God and he worshipped God. So Satan was wrong. So a little, little bit later on, Satan comes back into the presence of God. And he makes a second accusation. He said, well, you know, it's one thing to lose everything that you own, but a man will do anything to save his health. So if you take away his health, I promise you, he will curse you to your face and he'll stop serving you. And so God allows him to do that and he strikes him with diseases and he has terrible boils all over his body. And yet... He doesn't curse God. In fact, his wife actually encourages him to. She says, curse God and die. And he says, foolish woman, should we just receive good things from the hand of God and not also receive bad things? Again, his theology is wrong, but he refuses to curse God. Now, how many of you know if you're sick, it's one thing? Because you can usually think, well, in two or three days, I'll get better. But if you have some type of illness and it lingers for months... And it gets a little bit worse because the Bible says hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And so Job is not just sick for a few days. He's sick for months, maybe in a few years. But anyways, this leads up to the main part. So now that we finish the prologue, we're ready to move on and study the main part of the book. And this is the part where you get a chance to see how and when Job changed his theology. Plus you get to see why the book of Job is considered to be a book about grace. More specifically, a book about Jesus Christ. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at Job's character just to make sure that everyone understands that even though Job was a good man, he was still a sinner. Look back at the first verse in chapter 1. There was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. Now, the word blameless doesn't mean what we think it does. When we hear the word blameless, we think it means without sin. But that's not what it means. You see, the word blameless is translated from the Hebrew word tom. And when it refers to a person, it means that they love truth and they endeavor to live a moral and godly life. In other words, they strive to ensure that their thoughts, desires, words, and deeds are in accordance with the laws of God and also the laws of man. But according to the theological dictionary of the Old Testament, it does not mean sinlessness. It does not mean without sin. Yes, that person is striving to be godly both inwardly and outwardly, but it doesn't mean that they don't sin from time to time. However, if they do sin, they make amends. In other words, they do whatever is necessary to make it right, not only with God, but also with their fellow man. That's the type of person that Job was. In fact, there are three men that are said to be more righteous than all other men. 
And Job is one of the three. Do you know who the other two are? Noah and Daniel. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm going to read verse 14, and then we're going to jump down and read verse number 20. Here's verse number 14. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, their righteousness would save no one but themselves, says the sovereign Lord. So he's talking about this destruction that's going to come upon them. And he says, even if these three men were here, their righteousness would only be able to save themselves. But he sets them apart. Why? They are considered to be, by the Bible, the three most righteous men that have ever lived. Let's look at verse number 20. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, they wouldn't be able to save their own sons or daughters. They alone would be saved by their righteousness. So Job is in the top three when it comes to being a good person. But as righteous as these three men were, none of them were without sin. Romans chapter 3 verse number 10 says there is none righteous no not one you see the righteousness of man and the righteousness of God are two different things when we see the righteousness of man we need to understand that's by man's standards so when we look at a person we say that person is righteous it means that we can't see any fault but God knows what's in the heart of man God knows what's in the mind of man man has the atomic nature there are wrong desires sometimes We're inspired to do things that aren't right sometimes, even if we don't carry through with it. So we need to understand, according to God's standard of holiness, no no one is righteous, even those three. So what Job chapter 1 verse 1 is saying is that Job endeavored to be godly, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. In other words, he said He set boundaries in his life to make sure that he did not sin against God. So, now that you know that, let's move on. At the end of chapter 2, we find that after Satan struck Job with these terrible boils, three of Job's friends came to comfort and console him. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Job, chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy that he had suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite. When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust into the air over their heads to show their grief. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. So you had three friends that came to comfort and console Job. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And when they saw Job and the horrible boils that covered his body, they followed the cultural protocol showing their grief by wailing loudly, tearing their robes, and throwing dust in the air to let everyone know that nothing really matters as we see all of these catastrophes that have taken place. And then they sat down with Job, and they didn't say a word for seven days and seven nights because they didn't know what to say when they saw how much that he had suffered now let me ask you a question have you ever been in a situation when you went to comfort someone but you didn't know what to say in fact there really wasn't anything to say well that's how Job's friends felt Job had lost everything including his children and his health And all his friends knew to do was to sit down with him and to be there for him. Not saying anything, but just being there for him. You know, many times when I go to visit people, sometimes there's just nothing to say. You just want them to know that you're there for them. And sometimes that's all you can do in those type of situations. Now... After seven days and seven nights of no one saying anything, finally Job broke the silence. Scholars refer to it as Job's lament to his friends. In essence, what he said was he wished that he'd never been born. Look at Job chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to jump down and we're going to read verses 11 through 13. Notice what Job said. At last Job spoke and he cursed the day of his birth. He said, let the day of my birth be erased and the night I was conceived. Let that day be turned to darkness, let it be lost even to God on high, and let no light shine upon it. Now jump down to verses 11 through 13. 
Why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came from the womb? Why was I laid on my mother's lap? Why did the nurse, why did she nurse me at her breast? Had I died at birth, I would now be at peace. I would be asleep and at rest. And people, the whole chapter is like that. Now, once Job broke his silence, then his friends felt free to offer their advice because they truly wanted to help Job. And they thought that they knew what the problem was. You know, sometimes when we go to visit someone and they're going through something, we think we can help them. We think that we can give them some advice so that they can come out of this. So things can be made better. But here's what you need to know about their advice. Their advice was based on their theology. And their theology was wrong. You see, they believe that God rewards us and punishes us on this earth based on our works. Now, we refer to that as a works mentality. Everyone remembers what a works mentality is, right? A person with a works mentality believes that good people, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. They also believe that if you're good, you'll be rewarded. Not just in heaven, but also here on this earth. And if you're bad, you're going to be punished. People, that's a works mentality. And believe it or not, it's human nature to have a works mentality. Every one of us has a works mentality. That's why everyone wants to know, what must I do to be saved? There is something inside every one of us that wants to earn our salvation. In other words, we want to do something. Do I need to join the church? Do I need to become a member? Do I need to walk down the aisle? Do I need to be baptized? Do I need to say the sinner's prayer? And if I do, did I say it right? What do I need to do in order to be saved? Now, that's just one half of the works mentality. The other half is the belief that God is going to get you if you do something bad. Now, if you do something wrong and it's really not that bad, then don't worry about it. Just ask God to forgive you and he'll do it because it really wasn't that bad. If you tell a little white lie, well, I'll confess it to God. God, I said that. I shouldn't have said it. Please forgive me. And we forget about it and we go on. We steal a one-piece candy. We're at Reese's and we eat a grape. How many of you do that? I do that. You know why I do that? Not because I'm stealing. Because I want to know whether or not these grapes are sour or sweet. I'm not going to buy those grapes if they're sour. So I pick one and I'll eat one. I don't eat more than one. That's what I'm doing. All right? But you know, if you kind of feel guilty about it. Oh, God, forgive me for that. And guess what? You go on, you forget about it because it really wasn't that bad. But if you do something wrong and it was really, really bad, then it's not enough to ask God to forgive you. There's something within human nature that says you also need to do penance. And even then, God still might get you if it was really, really bad. And in cases like that, we actually develop a martyr spirit. Did you know that? Paul had a martyr spirit. Paul had, actually, Paul was responsible for Stephen's death. Did you know that? Yeah. They laid the coats at his feet. And if you understand the culture at that time, the person who made the accusation threw the first stone, then he would take a step back. Everyone else would start stoning. So they'd take their coats off so they could throw better. And they put the coats at his feet. He was responsible for the death of Stephen. And he was probably responsible for some of the death of others. And even though he knew Jesus forgave him for that, He always had a martyr spirit. That's why when they came and prophesied to him and said, don't go to Jerusalem, they're going to arrest you, turn you over to the Romans. He still was intent on going. In fact, all the way to the end, he wanted to be a martyr. And you want to know why? Because he could never get over what he had done. He had a martyr spirit. Now, some of you are like that. I estimate that probably 25% of the women in our church have had an abortion. Maybe you did it before you were a Christian. Maybe you were a Christian and you were just put in a tough situation and you didn't know what else to do and you did it. And you have asked God to forgive you. And you know that Jesus died for all sins, but there's just something inside of you that feels like, I just can't get over it and I need to do something. And you know, something bad happens in your life. Maybe that's God punishing you for having that abortion. Let me just say this. You're forgiven. Jesus died for that. And he paid the price for that. And he doesn't want you to have that martyr spirit. You are 
forgiven. Understand that. Now that doesn't mean we can go out and do what we want. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But we need to understand that God forgives. And there's not anything you can do to make up for that. But that's within human nature. We feel that way. People, that's the other half of the works mentality. It's the belief that God rewards us and punishes us here on this earth based on our works. In other words, if we go to church on a regular basis and we read our Bible and we pray and we live the way that we're supposed to, God's going to bless us. Good things are going to happen to us and we're going to prosper. But if we don't, then God's going to punish us on this earth. So a works mentality has two parts to it. The first part is the belief that good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. And most of you believe that. Even though you've grown up in church, even though you come here and you know it's not true. And you want to know why? Because grandma never asked Jesus in their heart. And we just want to think that she's in heaven. Listen to me. Good people do not go to heaven and bad people go to hell. The truth of the matter is bad people go to heaven because they believe in Jesus. They put their faith in Jesus. No one's good. No, not one. Jesus said that. The only one good is God. And Jesus was God. But anyways, the second part is the belief that you're, that if you're living the way you should, then good things are going to happen to you. In essence, your life on this earth is going to be great. Things are going to go smooth. God's going to bless you and reward you. But if you're not living the way that you should, then God's going to get you. He's going to punish you. And bad things are going to happen to you. Yeah. And that's the mentality that Job's friends had. But it wasn't just his friend. Friends, Job also believed that. So they all shared the same theology. But when all of those horrible things happened to Job, he began questioning his theology because he knew that he hadn't done anything to justify what had happened to him or at least he didn't think that he had in fact notice what he said to God in chapter 7 verses 15 and 16 and verses 19 through 21 I would rather be strangled rather die than suffer like this I hate my life I don't want to go on living oh Leave me alone for my few remaining days. Now, who's he talking to when he says, oh, leave me alone? He's talking to God. And as he's saying, quit punishing me, God. Just kill me. Get it over with. Now, jump down to verses 19 through 21. Same chapter. Why won't you leave me alone? At least long enough for me to swallow. If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Now, who's the watcher of all humanity? God. Only God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. Satan's not omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time. God is everywhere at all times. God also has the attribute of infinitude. That's why God could listen to everyone's praying at the same time. You know, if everyone starts praying inside here at the same time, I'm not going to understand anything. But not God. He has the attribute of infinitude. That's why he's the watcher of all humanity. He sees everything that we're doing. He knows everything in our heart. He sees what we're thinking. He knows what we're feeling. That's God. So he says, if I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Why make me your target? Anyone ever ask that? Am I a burden to you? Why not just forgive my sin and take away my guilt? Now notice that he said, if I have sinned, because he couldn't think of anything that he'd done to deserve or to justify what had happened to him. But if he had done something, he couldn't remember what it was. Was it really that bad thing, God? And why couldn't God just forgive him and take his guilt away? So through this process, Job began to question his theology, but not his friends. In fact, They were more convinced than ever that God rewards and punishes us here on this earth based on our works. So in essence, all three of his friends believe that Job must have committed some horrible sin for God to have punished him so severely. And Job just wouldn't admit it. 
So they were arguing with him and attempt to get him to admit that he had committed some horrible sin because after all, bad things don't happen to good people. How many of you believe that? Or at least that's the way it ought to be. Bad things don't happen to good people. Now, each one of his friends based their arguments on something different. Eliphaz's arguments were based on human experience. And that's how he framed his arguments. Look at Job chapter 4 verses 7 through 9. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Stop and think. Do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? Think about that, Job. When have you ever seen a good person die prematurely? When when have you ever seen someone who's righteous and holy have all this calamity come upon them? My experience. So he's basing his arguments on human experience. My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. A breath from God destroys them. They vanish in a blast of his anger. So according to Eliphaz, experience is our teacher. And it's taught us that people who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. God punishes them. But doesn't experience also teach us that sometimes trouble and evil come upon innocent people? Well, Eliphaz would say no. That's not true. They've sinned all right. They've just done it secretly. God sees what we don't. So if evil comes upon someone, it's because they did something that maybe we didn't see, but they did it in secret. Maybe they were watching porn in secret. Maybe they stole in secret. Maybe they lied and gossiped, but no one really knows except the person they lied to and gossiped with. Bildad's arguments were based on human tradition. In other words, this is what our ancestors have always taught. And if it's not true, then God would have corrected us by now. Look at Job chapter 8, verses 8 through 13, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Just ask the previous generation. Pay attention to the experience of our ancestors. For we were born but yesterday, and we don't know anything. Our days on earth are as fleeting as a shadow. But those who came before us, they lived for eight and nine hundred years. Before us will teach you. They will teach you the wisdom of old. Can papyrus reeds grow tall without a marsh? Can marsh grass flourish without water while they are still flowering? Not ready to be cut, they begin to wither more quickly than grass. The same happens to all who forget God. The hopes of the godless evaporate. In other words, if Job was as righteous as he implies, then he would understand that it was his own failures that produced this evil. No one who is truly good would ever experience what Job had. God would never allow that. And Zophar's arguments were based on human merit. In other words, he's going to argue that if a man has a right heart and he does what God requires, then God is going to reward him. God is going to bless him. And if he doesn't, then God will punish him. God will curse him. Look at Job chapter 11 verses 5 and 6. And then we're going to jump down and read verses 13 through 20. Here's verses 5 and 6. If only God would speak. If only he would tell you what he thinks. If only he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom is not a simple matter. Listen. God is doubtless punishing you far less than you deserve. Oh yeah. If God would reveal what you've secretly done. Then we would all know that you've not received half of what you deserve. You're being punished far less than what you ought to. Now, look at verses 13 through 17. If you would prepare your heart, he's talking to Job. If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands towards him. In other words, if you would repent, Job. If iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away. And would not let the wickedness dwell in your tents. In other words, if you would repent, Job. Then surely... You could lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear. Because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed away. It's already passed. And your life would be brighter than noonday. Though you were dark, you would be like the morning. In other words, Job, if you'll just admit what you've done wrong and repent, then God will quit punishing you and He'll reward you and He'll bless you So Job come clean. 
No one who's had even a sliver of good would ever find themselves in your situation or your predicament. Obviously, there's more evil in your life than you're willing to admit. There's more evil in your life than we suspected. All of your life has been a lie, and this is simply God revealing what you've tried to hide from everyone else. Now, of course, God told all three of Job's friends, you are wrong. Look at Job chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends. For you have not spoken accurately accurately about me as my servant Job has. Do you see that? God told all three of them, you are wrong. And your theology is wrong. You have not spoken accurately about me. You see, that's what theology is. Theology is the study of the character and attributes of God. And what he's saying is, the reason you've not spoken accurately about me is because your theology is wrong. What you think about me is not right. What you think happens does not happen. However, Job had finally gotten it right. He had changed his theology. He started out like them until all of these things happened. And when he started doing some soul searching, when he started falling on his face to God, when he started praying, his theology changed. And then he began to speak accurately about God. So let's look at how Job changed his theology once he started questioning the whole works mentality. Now, let me tell you that it didn't happen all at once. In fact, it came in spurts. And in sudden moments of revelation. And it came from trying to defend himself, his integrity and his character. Because in trying to defend his integrity and character, he found himself impugning God's character. Impugning God's righteousness. And here's how he impugned God's character and God's righteousness. First of all, he accused God of being unconcerned about his suffering. Some of you have thought that about God, haven't you? God, you don't even care that I'm sitting in here and I have no friends. God, you don't even care that I lost my job. God, you don't even care. Do you not know that you're impugning God's character? You're accusing Him of being uncaring concerning your suffering. You'll find that in Job chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, verses 11 through 24, chapter 13, verses 15 through 24. Secondly, He accused God of being unjust. In other words, God wasn't giving him what he deserved, which was release from suffering. God, I deserve that. You'll find that in chapter 19, verses 6 through 11, chapter 27, verses 2 through 6, chapter 9, verses 27 through 35, and chapter 10, verse number 1. Some of you do the same thing. You think God's not giving you what you deserve. Honey, you have no idea what you really deserve. Job's going to find that out. And last but not least, he accused God of being unfaithful. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. In other words, God was not rewarding Job for his innocence. You'll find that in chapter 9, verses 20 through 24, chapter 10, verse number 7, and verses 15 through 16. In essence, Job wanted wanted to tell the world how wrong God was. Sounds like some of you. You want to come to pastor. You want to tell me just how wrong God is. Hello, Job. But again, as Job was defending himself, he would get little bits of revelation. And with each bit of new revelation, his theology began to shift until he recognized he wasn't as sinless as he thought he was and he needed a Savior. In fact, he realized that all men need a Savior. So, let me show you how Job's theology evolved as he debated with his friends. First, He came to the realization that he needed an advocate. Write that word down. Advocate. Someone who could mediate between him and God. Turn to Job chapter 9 verses 32 through 35 and I'll show you what I'm talking about. God is not immortal like me. Honey, God transcends us. God is not immortal like us. So I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. If only there was a mediator between us, someone who might lay his hands on us both. Now you see that phrase? 
Someone who might lay his hands on us both, that's actually a figure of speech. It's referring to someone who can exist in both worlds. Someone who knows and understands both sides. Someone who can touch the spiritual and the physical at the same time. The mediator could make God stop beating me. And I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I cannot do that in my own strength. Now, here's what's interesting. Job realized that God transcends us, not just physically, but also spiritually, intellectually, morally, etc. So even if he wanted to come before God and plead his case, it just wasn't possible. So he cried out for a mediator, someone who could lay his hands on both parties. Now, people, that's an important statement because the only way that would be possible is if the, is if the mediator was both God and man. Let me say that again. The only way that would be possible is if the mediator was both God and man. And that's the first revelation that Job received. Man needs a mediator who is both God and man. Someone who's capable of touching God and man at the same time. Someone who can relate to both sides. The infinite, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, immutable, impassable, immortal, and just God. Who is spirit and not flesh. And also the finite, mortal, weak creature made from the dust of the earth. Someone who could be an advocate for man. And who is he describing? Anyone pick that up? Jesus. What he's wanting is Jesus. Notice what 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says about Jesus. My dear children, I am writing this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a mediator, who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. People, this is exactly what Job wanted. An advocate who pleads our case before God. You see, the word advocate is translated from the Greek word parakletos. And it refers to someone who pleads another person's cause before a judge. But people, if that's all Jesus does, then we're in big time trouble. Because Jesus can plead our cause all day long, but the sad truth is we're all sinners and we deserve to be punished. In fact, that's what Job said in chapter 4 verse 17. And he was right. Notice what Job said. Can a mortal be innocent before God? Can anyone be pure before the Creator? And the answer is no. God's standard of righteousness and man's standard of righteousness are two different things. Grandma might have been a great person. Let let me tell you, no one was more of a saint than my mom. I don't care how good you think your grandma was, she couldn't lick my mom's sandals. My mom was a saint. But let me tell you something. Her righteousness could not get her to heaven. Because God's standard of righteousness is so far above man's standard. That's what the Bible tells us. So we need a mediator. But we need someone more than a mediator. We need a redeemer. We need someone who will not only plead our cause, but will step in and pay for our sins. So when we stand before God, our advocate won't just be pleading our cause. Our advocate will say to God, those sins have been paid for. And that's what Job finally realized. He realized that we don't just need a mediator or an advocate. We need an advocate that will also pay the debt that we owe. In other words, someone who would pay the penalty for our sin. And that's what Job cried out for. Look at Job chapter 17 verse number 3. I would highlight this in the book of Job. It's one of the turning points that shifts his theology. Notice what he says. Give me. He doesn't say, I've earned it. He doesn't say, I'll take it. He says, God, give me, oh God, the pledge you demand. Who else will put up security for me? In other words, God, pay the debt I owe. You know that I can't pay the penalty I deserve, so please pay it for me. Be my co-signer is what he's asking. You see that word security? You know what it means? In Hebrew it means be my co-signer. Yeah. He's saying, God, 
pay my pledge for me. Be my co-signer. When I default on my obligations, would you pay for it? That's what Job was asking of God. And then it hit him. That's what he needed. He needed a redeemer, someone who would pay his debt, someone who would pledge himself as a co-signer, someone who would step in and pay the penalty when he goofed up. And that's when he realized that what that's what God was going to provide. God was going to provide a redeemer. He was looking at his three friends and he was thinking secretly inside, I know I'm better than you three, but look at what's happened. And God has showed me. A mortal can't stand in the presence of God. We need a mediator. But we need more than a mediator. We need a redeemer. Yeah. Look at Job chapter 19 verses 25 through 27. This passage of scripture needs to be underlined in your Bible and it needs to be highlighted. If you didn't bring your Bible, you go home. Write this down. Job chapter 19 verses 25 through 27. This is the shift in the book. This is where Job turns everything around. This is where his theology changes completely. And from this point on, things are going to look up for him. Notice what it says. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body is decayed, yet in my body I will see God. See, at this point he thought he was truly dying. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Now, the word redeemer is translated from the Hebrew word goel. And it refers to a person who redeems a kinsman. In fact, that's what he's actually called. He's called the kinsman redeemer. How many have heard that term, kinsman redeemer? If you're familiar with the Old Testament, that's what it's called, kinsman redeemer. In other words... He pays the debt and restores what that person lost and forfeited. Now, notice what Job said about the Redeemer. Look back at verses 25 through 27. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. He's not on the earth right now. But I know that even though he's not on the earth, he lives. Why? Because he's God. He's eternal. He's the mediator I wanted that could touch both sides. The one who could be both God and man. And I know that my Redeemer lives. And He will stand upon the earth at last. In fact, that's a bad translation. Actually, it should say, in the last days. You know, what's interesting is when Jesus came, Joel looks at that, the prophet Joel, as the last days began. But then we kind of think of the last days, and it's true. The last days is when Jesus Christ returns. And he says, and he will stand up on the earth in the last days. There's a time when Jesus is coming, and when Jesus comes, what's going to happen? Well, let's keep reading. And after my body is decayed, after my spirit has left my body, my body's put in the ground, and it begins to rot. After it has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. In other words, I will be resurrected. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. My body's going to be redeemed and resurrected because my Redeemer lives. And then he thinks or says, I am overwhelmed at the thought. In other words, this Redeemer is going to resurrect me in the last days. And I will stand before God completely forgiven because the Redeemer has paid my debt. And I will not be punished when I stand before God on that day. And people, that's exactly what we have in Jesus. So Jesus was what Job was looking for. You see, once Job realized that he could never be good enough, God started showing him what he needed. He needed a mediator, but he needed more than a mediator. He needed a redeemer. And once he realized that, he had the faith and confidence that God was going to provide one. And that redeemer is Jesus Christ. Now, let me show you how the mediator... And the Redeemer go hand in hand. Because we don't just need a Redeemer, we also need a Mediator. We need a Mediator and a Redeemer, and they go hand in hand. Look back at 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. 
But Jesus does more than just plead our case before God, who is the ultimate judge. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. This is a scripture I would underline and highlight in your Bible. So much, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Now the word surety is translated from the Greek word inguos. It's fun to say, inguos. And it literally means to go out on a limb. But when it refers to a person, it means cosigner. A cosigner is someone who pays the debt of another person when they default on their covenant obligations. A cosigner goes out on a limb for someone. If I go to the bank and I want to borrow money and they say, no, you don't have enough collateral. The only way we're going to give you this loan is if you get someone to cosign. So I come to you and I say, hey, the bank won't give me the money unless I get a cosigner. Would you cosign for me? Now, if you're a wise person, what are you going to say? No. Because you're going out on a limb for me. What that means is, if I get lazy, if I don't like my boss and I quit my job, if I decide that I want to retire early and I can't pay the, I can't pay the payments, then the bank's going to contact you. And you're responsible for making the payments. If you don't, they're taking your collateral. Yeah. So that's why that word inguos means to go out on a limb. For the Jews, it became a word that meant to cosign because you're going out on a limb for someone. So let me explain what this is saying. Hebrews 7, 22. When you stand before God, Jesus is going to be your advocate. He's going to be your mediator. He's going to plead your cause before God. But he's going to do more than that. He's going to tell God. Yes, God, Alan Nolan has defaulted on his covenant obligations. He gets up and he preaches every day, but you ought to see the hypocrite he is. You ought to see what he does in private. But God, it doesn't matter because I want you to understand something. I paid for that. When he defaulted on his covenant obligations, that's paid for. Now, I want you to understand something. It's not going to be Jesus pointing out my faults. It's going to be Satan, the accuser. But every time the accuser says, God, he did this. My mediator stands up and he says, yes, he did that. But God, I paid for that. Oh, that's paid for. Yeah, because that's what a cosigner does. Every sin I've ever done or will do because Jesus is God and omnipresent. So not only were my sins currently and past paid for but even the sins I'm going to commit in the future every time the devil gets up and accuses me and says this is what Alan did Jesus stands up as my mediator my advocate he says that's true God he did that but I paid for that I paid what he owed people that's what Job needed and that's what Job got you see Job said goodbye to his works mentality and he said hello to grace And more specifically, the grace of Jesus Christ. He didn't know who Jesus was. He just knew that this person was coming. And it ended up being Jesus. Job spoke accurately about God because he realized, number one, that no mortal could ever be innocent before God. Number two, he realized that he needed a mediator who could lay his hands on both parties. In other words, he needed a mediator that was both God and man. Number three, he realized he needed a redeemer who would not only pay his debt, but would act as surety so when he defaulted, when he goofed up, that Redeemer would pay his debt. And last but not least, he realized in the last days he would be resurrected and see God and he wouldn't be held accountable because his Redeemer had paid it. Now listen to me, this is really good. Job was a literal person. He really lived. But the person of Job is also allegorical. Job represents before his theology changed. He represents every person who's going to go to hell. Because you see, with this works mentality, everyone inside of them thinks if I'm good, I get to go to heaven. If I'm a good person, God's going to bless me. But the truth of the matter is there's no one good except for God. And Jesus, thank God, was God. And so what happens is, one day the accuser is going to come and as a result of him being there and we don't have a mediator, if we haven't accepted Jesus Christ, then we're going to lose everything we own. We're going to lose our family. And we're going to suffer pain and suffering in hell for all eternity. 
So Job represents every person who's going to hell. But Job also represents everyone who's going to heaven. But the ones he represents going to heaven are the ones that change their theology. That realize that I can't be good enough. And even when I want to give God what I want, I still won't be good enough. I need a mediator. I need a redeemer. Oh, and that person is Jesus. And you put your faith in Jesus. And when you do that, then God restores We're not going to look at the epilogue because it's 11 o'clock and I don't have time. But the epilogue, God restores everything. And when we get to heaven, hopefully our whole family's there. But if not, we get new family. We've laid up these things that's going to be there in heaven. And God restores everything to the way it was before the fall. Let me tell you something. Job is not the book you think it is. Now, if you're scared of what happened to Job might happen to you, it will only happen to you, and I'm talking spiritually, If you reject Jesus Christ. Job is a book about grace. Job is a book about Jesus. It prophesies about Jesus. And it tells us if we change our theology and realize we're not good enough and we look for this mediator who's both God and man, we look for this mediator who's also a redeemer who will pay our debt, then we can have all things restored and we'll go to heaven when we die.